Hello and welcome everyone to today's tutorial on land units. I will tell you all you need to know about them and how they work. There are two types of units, mechanized units and flesh units. Before we dive into them, however, we first need to understand the similarities between them. 1. All melee land units have an invisible attack range. For infantry and tanks, this is 23 minutes from a target on the enemy territory, while for cavalry and armor cars, it's slightly less thanks to their movement speed. 2. Land units are weaker at sea and when disembarking. This is why you should always engage an enemy when they are disembarking and if you decide to invade someone by the sea yourself, make sure you have enough battleship or light cruiser support for your units. 3. Each unit type in a stack has a cap on their damage. This means that a stack of 1000 infantry has the same damage as a stack of 100 infantry. To maximize the damage of your stack, you should combine different types of units. Most of units max damage caps at stack of 40, but I encourage you to look at the sheets on Reddit to see it in detail yourself. Link in the description below. 4. Morale of your units average when combined. This is why it is wise to keep your low morale units in a separate stack, unless it's more expensive unit, since you can use this to heal your heavy tanks as well as bombers. And of course, 5. Max movement of a stack depends on the slowest unit within that stack. So, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about two unit types. First, the flash unit. Both infantry and cavalry count as the flash units, or that's how I call them at least. One thing that set these units apart is their morale. While every unit has morale, flash units have more influence factors. The morale of your flash units is influenced by the morale of the province they are recruited or produced in. This means that the starting morale of an infantry and cavalry depends on the morale of the province that they are produced in. 2. The morale of province they are stationed in. At the end of the day or day change, units morale increases or decreases depending on difference between the province morale and the unit morale. So basically, if they are stationed in a low morale province, their morale will decrease. If they are stationed in a high morale province, their morale will increase. 3. Infantry and cavalry lose morale at the day change if they are at sea. This averages at 50%, so if troops' morale is lower than 50, it will increase until it hits 50. To prevent your troops from losing morale at sea, you can combine them in a stack with a single light cruiser or battleship. 4. Uprising suppression. Flesh units lose morale in case of uprising suppression, but this is mostly because of low morale of the province. 5. Food stock. If your food stock hits zero and you have minus production, your troops will lose morale. And that's the basics you need to know about the flesh units. As for the second unit type, we have mechanized units. Now, while the morale of flesh units can be seen as their health, morale of mechanized units can be seen as their condition. There are a few things to note here. 1. Mechanized units don't lose morale at sea or when stationed in a low morale province. 2. Both the tank and heavy tank lose their morale when in combat and slowly recover it at the end of each day. 3. The artillery and armored card can be destroyed in battle even if they have 100% morale. 4. Ranged units have an invisible splash damage. This is approximately 2 to 3 minutes from a target on your own territory. There is no friendly fire, however, when it comes to splash damage. So, since we are done with the basics, let's dive into each unit type. Infantry. Infantry is the pawn of supremacy 1914. They are a flesh unit, so maintaining their morale is important. If their morale decreases, so will their strength. Low morale infantry die faster, deal less damage and are less effective against uprisings. At the start of the game, infantry is your main offensive and defensive unit. Keeping them alive, therefore, is important as it takes days to recruit them. You can increase their recruitment speed by building barracks, but don't forget that they have high upkeep in grain. Mid to late game, infantry will be your meat shield. You basically put them in a stack to defend your mechanized units. The more infantry you save at the start of the game, more tanky you will be later on. Don't forget the morale though, as low morale infantry will die much faster. Cavalry and armored cars. These two are the fastest land units in the game and the first ones you can produce. There are two key differences between them. The first is their strengths. Armored cars have twice as much defensive damage than infantry meaning that when they are standing idle in a province or on the road, they use their defensive stats when enemy engages them. When engaged in combat, if you instruct them to move or attack, they will use their offensive stats as well. While attacking back will kill the enemy sooner, your armored cars will die faster as well, since their offensive stats are quite low. Cavalry, on the other hand, has twice as much attack damage as infantry, keeping them idle, therefore, when enemies attacking you is wasteful and they won't be using their high damage stats. So long story short, attack with cavalry and defend with armored cars. 
The second difference between them are the resources. Both of them require workshop to be produced and increasing workshop to level 2 will double their production speed. While cavalry may seem cheaper at first, don't forget that they need barracks as well as workshop to be produced. Barracks have high grain upkeep and require lumber which might be expensive early on. If your country has high material production, you should go for armored cars. But if you have high food production, go for cavalry. Technically speaking though, armored cars can be used offensively as well since they have higher movement speed and can cut off enemy roads and provinces. Tanks! Tanks are the strongest land units you can produce and to be honest, there's not much of a difference between them. Heavy tanks are best when attacking fortresses as they can destroy level 5 ones quite easily. Tanks are effective as well but they die sooner. The main difference between the two besides the stats are the production time and resources. Tanks are cheaper and require 12 hours less to produce within a level 4 factory. While this might not seem much, it is sometimes enough to get them to the front lines. Because of this, I mainly use heavy tanks as the main offensive unit while I use tanks to support and increase the strength of my stacks. This is especially useful since they have the same movement speed as infantry and thus same attack range. Much later in the game, when you have plenty of tanks, mixing up the two is a good idea since the damage of both the tank and the heavy tank caps at stack of 25, not 40 as with the infantry. Artillery if infantry is the bread of supremacy 1914, then artillery is your butter. These guys are the most powerful unit in the game in my opinion and you can never have enough. They are the first range unit you get and they are perfect at taking out fortresses and minimizing your infantry losses. Of course, since artillery is a mechanized unit, its morale acts differently and can die within a stack even if it has 100% morale. While at sea, they are as useless as it gets since they can't shoot and they die faster. To produce artillery you need level 1 factory. I recommend producing artillery as soon as you can and produce them as much as you can because they can last you the whole game. They are also one of the fastest mechanized units you can produce as level 4 factory only needs 24 hours to produce them. Main things to note about artillery. 1. They are one of the slowest units in the game so if you have them in a stack keep that in mind. Two. Just like all ranged units, they have a splash damage, so use this to your advantage and be careful when enemies bombarding your stack. 3. Artillery can outrange light cruisers, so they are effective at defending your shores early on in the game. 4. Never attack with artillery. It is smarter to position them so the enemy falls within their range. If you instruct them to attack an enemy stack and they go out of your artillery's range, it will start chasing the target. You can use this to your advantage if the enemy is inactive to take out their artillery. 5. If you position your artillery too close to your infantry stack at the front, they might get pulled into close combat with them. This is why you need to keep enough distance between your army at the front and your artillery at the back. 6. When artillery is engaged in close combat, they can't fire. 7. Attack damage of artillery caps at stack of 50, so more than that will have the same damage, but don't forget that you might lose some in battle, so having more than 50 ensures that your damage output remains high. As for the role of artillery, they are your main offensive unit start to mid game. Late game they can also be your main offensive unit depending on how you play, but they are mostly used as supporting unit behind the tanks. Railgun. Railgun is the strongest yet least effective unit in the game. It has the longest attack range after fighters and bombers and double the damage of an artillery. While their damage is high, single railgun can't do much. This is a problem since they are the most expensive unit you can produce and they are the slowest which makes them vulnerable. To make things worse, they need railways as well as factory to produce and in case the railway is damaged with their province that they are stationed in, they will not be able to move anymore. This is why you should never put them on enemy territory as they can disable their railways and trap you. The main role I use railgun for is defending your coast as they can outrange battleships and light cruisers. You can also use railguns to attack the enemy front lines behind your defenses or to protect your front lines from enemy artillery stacks. Don't forget though that they are slow and vulnerable so they can be taken out easily with enemy planes if you leave them unprotected. So I hope you enjoyed my tutorial on the basics on land units and how they work. Hopefully this helps you win the games and please stick around since the next tutorial I'll be making will be on more advanced techniques. Thank you for watching, please share the knowledge so other players may learn these tricks and we may have more challenging gameplay. Anyways, don't forget to enjoy the game, please like if you liked it and comment, it helps a lot. Bye!